I welcome you to the talk and we'll have a good conversation about art and motherhood. We have our panelists here, but I'm really going to ask questions of all of us. And whether you're an artist and a mom, or just an artist, or just a mom, or neither, please jump into the conversation with us. And um, I'm Atamari Koto, Ko Elaine Tapuluma. I'm Elaine Rollins. I'm coordinator, um, public programs assistant curator here at the Government Brewster Art Gallery. And so I'll, I'll start this morning. We'll just start it with um, Karakia, just to settle us here into the space. So, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And we can go ahead and get started. Um, we have on the, the far end, we have Solome Tonibasa. We have Emily Tobaya in the middle and Teresa Tony here. And the three artists here will introduce themselves and say a little bit about themselves and then we'll have some question and answers. But we'll start with Emerita. Hi, my name is Emerita. Um, should I just start talking about my work? So yeah, this is the first body of work I made after graduating from Fine Arts at Mercy University. This was showed at the Room Gallery and the title was called I Love More Than Two Loves. The work is what so my works focuses on the goose mothers phenomenon, which is when career mothers often move by way to better their children's education. And the term refers to how wild geese fly far away to feed the offspring. You can also hear um, the phenomenon also called kirogi families, which in Korean it means goose. So this work draws on kind of merging Western quilting and Korean quilting techniques together because in Korea they don't really have like a duvet cover and a duvet inner it's more just like it's one thing and you have stitches to go going through it and repetitive lines to make the fabric stronger so I was interested in kind of drawing in from those ideas and creating these uh, bodies that for me kind of resembled kind of the Korean diasporic community and just my shared experiences with other Koreans and also with my mother. And the reason why I picked this one was, this one's called Julie, which is my mother's name. And I just named it her because that's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> so this show, I don't know if it was this year or last year, I can't remember anymore. But this was shown at Tui Gallery and for a group show called The Inner Lives of Islands. This is a reworked body of work that's called, that kind of responds to uh, this everyday or traditional object called bottari, which is when you wrap like your food, clothes, gifts when you're traveling from one place to another. I was really interested in how the object itself embodies these ideas of being in between spaces, which a lot of Korean migrants or people that kind of feel like they belong in two places, not just like this place or that place, experience within their everyday life. The middle part of that is cast with polyurethane. And um, that I wanted to kind of show that it, it's like unable to be open or you know, unable to be wrapped and kind of integrate with society. And this was the work called O, which is currently showing at the Gavit Brewster in the window space. So a lot of my work is really interested in, in a way, drawing from my mother's experience living here, kind of the sacrifices she's had to make for my siblings and I. And in Korea, like the goose mother's phenomenon, ducks and geese are quite a symbolic animal, symbolic, symbolic thing in Korea. And one of them that they uh, they use traditionally is you have two geese or two ducks together, and they're wrapped in a bordari, which symbolizes you know the 
it's like kirogi, I don't know what it's called in English, but when one passes away, they mourn their partner for the rest of their life. So it's often used as a symbol for marriage. I was, a, kind of, I was really interested in those ideas and kind of wrapping them up individually in a sense that like a loss of their partner, don't know where they are and kind of not being wrapped up together. So I was interested in drawing on those ideas and the title of, in Korea, five, there's two ways of saying it, but one of them is all. So, and I was interested in kind of bringing in those elements, but the O, when in the olden days before they were carved wooden ducks, oh, when they were carved wooden ducks, the carver would have to kind of think of these five wishes while they're carving it. So one of them, they would have to have like a son themselves. So one of them would be like having a son and then not having any family members that have been divorced or, you know, like infidelity or like good prosperity, things like that. And the reason why I was kind of interested in drawing that, those five wishes or a symbol of those five wishes into my title is I wanted to challenge kind of those traditional ways of thinking and those five wishes of what someone wishes. I know that doesn't make sense because, you know, like I don't think necessarily you know, divorce is like a bad thing and I don't think you necessarily need to have a son. You know, this, this is like a very old or traditional way of thinking, which has definitely impacted Korean society and not just Korean society, but how Korean diasporic community engage with life here in a lot of transnational communities. So I wanted to bring in those ideas within this way. Kia some things you want to talk a little bit about your practice okay uh yes yeah, so these are the photos that um are from my instagram because i i don't know i don't have a camera so i just have a camera on the phone so uh, i just went through instagram and just got a few um images of the works that i've made um before i had a studio so i didn't have a studio so there was a time where I had to make a show for um, for a Tim Melville gallery and it happened to um, fall in the summer. So I was outside and my mom and the neighbors were like, is she talking? <laughs> um, so yeah, so I had to utilize the space. I think that's what happens when um, you, know, you don't have the means or spaces and you, you want to be creative so you make use of whatever you have around you and to dry these um, canvases I'll just you know chuck them on the line um, and that was pretty fun um, so yeah those are the pieces that were for that show um, this is my first time painting big so that's why it was kind of um, new to the scale but also um, kind of dreaming for a studio space <laughs> to um, avoid like sand flies <laughs> uh, acrylic paint so uh, and also the leaves just happened to fall and um, I had to work with that environment so yes it's fun working outside but you want your work to not be smudged by like a bug or something <laughs> Well, you were saying that you did this before you had a studio space. Do you paint them outside as well? Yes, so they're all painted outside. So I would, because it was summer, I just had to, again, use time as a factor for me to be like, okay, well, I've got this amount of daylight and um, I could like do the first layer in the first morning and gesso it all. And um, yeah, so it was me trying to prepare myself, working in elements, so yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the next couple of pictures are pictures of me and my sons at Piha. Um, it was the first time for me to do a residency just for a week at the um, Way Good Foundation, which is a, a little place that's in Piha. And it was my first time there was this year in April, um, which I've requested to bring my boys. So a residency that caters for family is a really big thing for me because it allows me to um, take my sons, so 
The one in the green jumper is Xavier, he's my oldest, and then Eli on the other side with the mustard shorts. That's my youngest, he's um, 12, and the one in the middle is my nephew. So they travel everywhere together. Um, so to have um, accommodating, um, uh, let's say, like a program or like a residency that can cater for families is a really big thing for me because then being away for even a week is a big thing. Um, and then I've known these residencies for these three months, so I don't know how I could cope um, knowing that I've got um, teenagers to care of. And because I stay at my mum's, it can be a bit like my mum wants a break, so <laughs> it's nice to have this opportunity. So it was really nice to make books there and get them outside. And um, yeah, they're just hanging out with the stream down there and then there's the beach there. Um, yeah, it was just really lovely, and it's just like forming memories, especially for them. So it's a, um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and then we, you know, we, there's different places to sleep, and then there's the um, yurt um, that we all decided to just get all the mattresses and just hang out and um, went down for a walk at the beach. So like having a place in um, a residency that can cater for that helps a lot. Yeah. Mm. Jerusalem, can you talk to us a little bit about yeah. your body? Naka. Um, this piece was made probably a couple of years ago. This is one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of my work, uh, I guess I describe them as like diary entries. <laughs> and they sort of reflect um, the season I'm in or the journey I'm on. And often uh, it's my connection to my faith and, and it's a type of worship to me. And so you'll see in my works a lot of images that are symbols of faith, you know, the dove or um, flowers. And I'm really inspired by nature and you can see an influence of my, um, my Samoan heritage a lot through my work, which is just... I think it's just in my DNA, so it just flows through to what I do automatically. I use a lot of text in my work, uh, which often are uh, Bible verses or quotes that are very dear to me at that time. Uh, so I create a lot of, a lot of my works are on card or uh, materials that are really easy to access, uh, that are affordable and that are quick, quick studies. Um, I don't have a I don't have a studio as such to work at home. So a lot of my work is done when I, you know, the kids are sleeping, or at school, you know, in the kitchen, <laughs> sort of thing. So it's stuff that's easy to pack up, um, quick to dry, that sort of thing. And um, I don't I don't create works as such um, all the time. It's I just feel that it's my my happy place and my time out from whatever I'm doing. And so it is a real place of joy for me to um, create. So uh, I guess I'm not really comfortable with being having a, a title as an artist <laughs> because art has always been a part of who I am or creating has been. So, yeah. Uh, this is a painting done like a year ago, a couple of years ago, I'm not sure, but um, this was sort of inspired during a time in, at home when my, my, my children were having a lot of sleep issues. So I was awake a lot at night. And so um, I always found too that my, my boys in particular, when it was a full moon, they wouldn't sleep. So the full moon was really symbolic of my life in this season of, of insomnia. <laughs> and so it comes as, as I was trying to look at it in a positive light as well. You know, I just see... Um, being up at night was a real time of reflection for me, time to create. And um, so, yeah, that speaks about, um, yeah, just that that period of time when I was with my boys up at late, late at night sometimes. So, um, a lot of my work is influenced by, um, yeah, like I said, I was influenced a lot by making of my grandmother and of both my grandmothers and just that making of 
traditional taonga, um, or naku, or um, fine mats. And so I've always been drawn to those um, forms of making, um, seeing my mum and my grandparents creating with their hands. And these, so these particular pieces, um, I was really interested in trying to emulate those um, special mats and and trying to reflect them on card or paint or so I think I was thinking here is that I can't physically or I don't have the knowledge to physically weave or um, or make naku or make siato so I try to do that through my work so I like to these these this work in particular took quite a long time there's a lot of just monotonous drawing and you're just sitting there doing the same repetitive actions. And I kind of like that it kind of really reflected the same as we did. So that sitting and just zoning out and being comfortable in that space. So yeah, it was just, um, it also sort of symbolizes the Samoan Iokonga, which is the top mat and the, and the Ngatul is Tongan. So it was also reflective on my children being Samoan Tongan heritage, my husband's Tongan. So, really interested in those things and um, I think more recently I mean it's done a real full circle I've been throughout my work I've been really influenced by images of the Pacific and the making and now having an opportunity to work in groups of um, women who collectively make ngaku or traditional tapa siapu so I'm really interested in the collective um, concept of making with women sitting in those spaces and um, yeah and it just feels like a beautiful circle of when I was younger now coming to a space where I can be um, with other women and having those really valuable discussions about our heritage and our ancestors and the making and, and learning those um, skills so yeah you want to Cross back over. Um, <clears throat> I loved hearing all of you and what you were talking about, but you know, all three of you seem to talk a little bit about how your mom or your grandmother influenced your practice. And so I think I wanted to start our conversation out this morning. Um, actually, I want to pause myself because I want to acknowledge. Um, Simon Gennard here in the audience. Um, Simon works here at the gallery. He's assistant curator of contemporary art. And I just have to tell you that Simon was the impetus for this topic, art and motherhood, because one of the artists in our current exhibition, um, it's a collection show over in the Govet, is Maria Olson. And when we were thinking about public programs for this show, Simon said, what about the topic of art and motherhood? Because it's something that Maria grappled with quite a bit as well. And this was quite up for her in her practice. I said, it's a great idea. There's some great women who could address this issue. So yeah, let's talk about that. So thank you, Simon, very much for that. Um, so I think my first question would be, um, talk a little bit about, and I want the audience, I want you to think about this as well in your life, talk about how, was your mother supportive of you becoming an artist or not? And um, um, what was that like for you in, in your practice? Anyone can start. <laughs> um, yeah, I think going back to um, art school was um, like, I had family like, oh, what are you doing? Like, it's not financially stable job. Um, from what people have seen in the past. But I guess when um, you know, I started to exhibit and you know, took it seriously, I think that's when the family started to see, oh, she's not working around, she's, she's actually you know, being serious with this. So um, that's when they started to kind of breathe out that relief, they like, oh, she's okay. Um, but yeah, at first it was not a degree that they were kind of into at first, but um, yeah. But I don't know what that was like for you guys. Was that the same thing for any of you guys? Um, for me, definitely not. I think, you know, 
like I said, within my work, how they, how a lot of people from like transnational communities and identities, you kind of have in this constant state of like in betweenness. And you know, she migrated here with a language barrier, raising three children alone. So basically, her desire in life is stability, and. Her oldest daughter chose one of the most unstable <laughs> careers. So, of course, that's going to be really daunting and scary as a mother because, you know, a lot of mothers, the thing that, well, I'm not a mother, but I think that a lot of things that they find most important is for your child to be safe, for your child to have the support they need and to, you know, live a good, healthy life. So in that sense, she was very... Kind of scared. I don't think she was like not supportive, but just really scared about the idea of me choosing something creative. But I think, you know, having a younger sister, she was, you know, my younger sister was like, you need to support Emerita. Like, how you support her is by saying, you can do it, not, are you sure you should do this? <laughs> so, in that sense, um, she's come around a lot more. And I think she understands that it's something that I genuinely love and that I'm passionate about. Because recently I was like, Mom, I think I'm going to quit up before I'm 30. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. And she was like, laugh. And she was like, you can't quit something you like, you know. So I was like, okay. Like, I think she, I think the more time we spend together she, and the more I grow up, I think she starts to understand who I am as a person. And in that sense, I think she's started to open up a bit more, open up to like a lot of different possibilities that can happen, especially within the kind of time that we live now. So, yeah. yeah. And Marita, when I've talked to you in the past, we have spoken about how much of your mom is influences your practice. Do you talk to your mom about that? Do you talk to her about how much of her thoughts or memories or ideas influence your work? At the start, not really, because, you know, it's much easier talking to people about it that don't live, don't share the same experiences as, as I do. But it's really confronting, and it really confronts a very vulnerable part of yourself when you talk about people that might empathize with your experiences. And sometimes, you know, people don't want to be in that position where they have to be vulnerable like that. And especially when, um, through my practice and understanding how our experiences are much a larger social and cultural issue, it's easier for me to understand it. But for people like my mother that hasn't had the opportunity to do so, you know, it definitely still feels like it's just like her life, her experiences, things like that. So it was really difficult to talk about it at the start. But my younger sister was like, what is your art even about? And she was like, I'm looking at it and I don't even get it. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to tell you what my art is about. Because, you know, every time I come home, she's like, your art's so late. But I don't know. <laughs> so I was like, okay, maybe, maybe it's time. <laughs> and then so I talked to her about it and she was like, whoa. That's so intense. <laughs> yeah, she was like, wow. She's, you know, to her, art's like flowers and portraits, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, it's a very like traditional or a specific way of understanding art. So now my sister knows what my practice is about, and I slowly kind of bring it in with my mother, but you can see just the impact of envir the environment has on the way she thinks, because I would talk to her about it. And she's like, Emerita, no one cares about <laughs> Korean culture. She's like, no one's going to listen if this is the stuff you talk about. Mm. You know, because she's like, because that's how life and just the Eurocentric view in New Zealand or a lot of places has made people believe that, you know, their culture is not validated in a way or the way they think or it's just not like powerful or strong enough for it to be something. So, you know, when she responds like that, and I'm like, that's why we need to have those conversations because it is important, you know. Mm. So she, like, half gets it, <laughs> you know. And then every time I show her a new body of work, and she's like, what do people think? And I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, 
She's so funny. <laughs> and she's like, I just don't get it. It's really confusing. And then I'm like, the more you're confused about it, that's how I know I'm doing a good job. <laughs> you know. And then when I was young girl, I was like, Solomon, my younger brother's called Solomon. I was like, Solomon, I'm so stressed. Like, my show's looking so bad. It's like, who cares? No one gets art anyway. <laughs> like, that is probably the best advice I've ever received. He's like, it doesn't even matter if you made something bad or good because no one understands art. <laughs> so, yeah, so the more my family doesn't understand my work, I guess the more I'm doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I hear in what your brother said to you, it doesn't matter what other people think, it's, it's just what you're doing and what yeah. you understand. It doesn't matter if I get it or not. Yeah. Oh. I think with when I make, I don't really think about whether people would like it or not. You know, it's it's a very intuitive thing for me, and I think ultimately I'm the one that has to make peace with it. I'm the one that's like thinking about it. So there's just a line where I'm like, okay, I'm happy, and then I can let go of it. Whereas I guess for like people that like my mum, that's you know, really craves or desires stability, you know, what other people think is like a really important aspect. And especially in a lot of like Korean culture, you know, what people think and how they view your life is, is viewed as something really important. You know, like when you go to church and like when people talk about what their children are doing, you know, it's more just the fact that even though you might be open to these ideas that your children do, you know, I think they really care about what other people think of your family and how you you represent your family. Yeah, she said she's had to deal with three very independent children. <laughs> yeah, tell me for that, mm -hmm. Teresa. Can you talk a little bit about what your family thought when you decided to go into art? Uh, I think growing up, um, because I loved art at school. I was never a studious person in terms of math, science, English sort of thing. I loved creating or being in the art room and art was my my passion and so my parents, I was really fortunate that my parents were really supportive um, with that because they knew that it was something I was reasonably good at um, and I think early on I kind of knew that I wanted to be an art teacher so the fact that they knew that I had some sort of end goal to all this <laughs> and their teaching is actually you know, a good career, you know, that they, they were accepting of that too. But also um, the fact that I could study art at university was also a bonus because, you know, um, going to university was, you know, the bee's knees growing up and, you know, and, you know I grew up and so they were really proud of that fact. Um, but I think also, my mum and my dad, they can see, they can identify with a lot of the work that I do through a lot of my imagery. And so they, I think they can, they understand. <laughs> you know what I mean? They can understand what I'm doing or they can, um, so that made it easier as well because they could, you know, they saw the, the beauty of the work that I made. So, yeah, they were a lot more encouraging in that sense. Um, but definitely, yeah, I am blessed that because I'm not a lot of uh, families and you know, Pacifica families are real supportive of art as a career or following pursuing that in studies. It's more seen as like a hobby or a side gig, <laughs> um, and get a real job sort of attitude. But you know, my parents were very, um, and I think because my mum's very creative in the sense that she's you know, she was a very well um, kind of like seamstress. She made, she was a dressmaker, she was very good with her hands and uh, she crocheted and she made things. So she kind of, she kind of got that. And I think that's where I we hear it all gone. Yeah, so. Mm. What about any of you in the audience here? Do you have any comments about this topic? I'm so inspired. And yeah, I'm really privileged to be with us for you. Um, I'm actually like majorly getting downloads while you're speaking and this whole topic of um, art passed on from my mother 
and her mother, who actually was a, a woman of some want descent in England, who I know that mum. So, and she was, you know, as with you, I'm like, oh, she, that is my creative life. And it's our timeline, you know, it's not even my blood, but just that when we would go and stay with her in Auckland, she had all the art, and mm. um, her screens were all creative. And, um, and my mum, despite our major differences, yeah, she's, she's the creative one of my parents, and so, um, yeah, this is really beautiful to me, this idea of, um, yeah, just a, a really precious thing coming through our, our female line. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, well. mm -hmm. Any, anyone else? I'm just, um, just interested in the aspect of what Salome was saying about the residency and um, the importance of, you know, fostering art amongst women, that we make a provision for family, because mm -hmm. family is so important, mm -hmm. um, and that it, there is some foresight out there saying, you know, if we really want to contribute to um, the art and, and women in art, that we make these um, support structures in place mm -hmm. for women in art, mm -hmm. um, and what the needs are for women rather than what we perceive the needs are. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, from, from a from cultural perspective, you know, a lot of um, <coughs> people would want to go away and be away from their family. But, you know, that we have to look at what people's own perspectives are mm -hmm. of what they need to be creative mm -hmm. to I think that's why I love working in a collaborative environment like Evie, where your children are in the space as well, and that's all part of the making. Them with the work, them experiencing the work, them watching us. It's that intergenerational um, communication through the making of their mums or mothers, and having children present eliminates that, you know, that guilt that. Uh, there's some way where you're doing this. <laughs> um, and I think it's really important that we don't feel guilty about taking space and making um, and being torn. And I think our, our, ancestors, our ancestors do it very well and that they incorporate all the generations in the making. Do you want to talk a little bit about Evie? Oh, so so Evie. Evie is a, collect a collective of women who were really interested in making um, traditional or uh, learning from our makers of um, traditional cloth and weaving and just the um, process of from the growers right through to the end piece of work and then we like creating together and coming up with the um, we're just learning how it was done in the Pacific, you know, and uh, I love that Ebony, who is one of the leaders of Evie, is really open to sharing that knowledge that she has, and we, we create not for commercial um, purposes, we're there to learn about the processes from the, from the, the earth and the ground all the way to the pigments, to the making of the cloth, and then using those pieces for community purposes. So we mm -hmm. share what we've made, so they have a purpose. We used, they're not exhibited or um, mm -hmm. sold. <laughs> so I love that. I love that concept of, mm -hmm. and you come in and out when it allows, you know, some of us are there, some of us not, just depending on what your life looks like. So not having those constraints to make is really important. I like what you said a minute ago about um, being comfortable to take the space mm -hmm. to create, to make. And it reminded me a little bit, Salome, of what you've often said of your practice of working in um, your mom's kitchen or working out in the garden. And um, something that you had said earlier, which is really nice, that you talked about the life behind the artwork and that um, that 
a lot of times when people see the work, they don't understand all that went on behind it. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think um, like getting used to well, the whole process of like making and the fact that for my schedule, it's it's pretty time consuming. Like time is pretty um, valuable for me because I need to, you know, take the boys to their training. I need to take them to school. I need to go get the shopping. I need to like do these other things before I can um, get into making in a studio. So I get that all lined up before I can get into the zone of making. And then once I'm in the studio, it's just, it's work. Like I can't muck around, I can't be on Instagram scrolling. Like <laughs> it's like, oh no, I have to be here because I've already said to my family, I'll be here for like four hours and then I'm out. And then I'm going back to um, like going to the laundry, doing all of that. And then on top of that, get ready for work. So um, when I have works that are finished and then seeing them in a different light, like in their exhibit, it's just, my mind just blows because I just, I can't believe like this is the finished work and then someone finds it really interesting and they want to purchase it. And that's just another um, awesome thing on top of it. So um, yeah, a lot of love, a lot of um, energy that goes into it. But there's a lot of, um, yeah, support from family to help me get to that point. So it's a, it's a big journey mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for, I guess, people who are in the creative field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does that resonate with any of you out there? Um, I'm I'm wondering uh, if you could even go further into that about just the some of the darker sides to that space and any guilt from the leaving or any um, resentment about the restraints that are placed on you, especially those of you who are already mothers, but you know, as well, or anyone here, just. Mm. Mm. Yeah, what, what do you do with that when this comes up for you? Yeah. Mm. I think it was, I, I felt guilty before, but now I'm just like, when I'm making the work, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like empowered, like I'm doing this, something that's opposite from what people would normally think as like a career. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, to to show my boys to be like, hey, you, you do something you love, or, you know, or for tuition, like you, people will start to see your energy. Um, so in that way, it cancels out their guilt mm -hmm. for me. But, um, and I think for like my son, like he wants to get into music and stuff. I'm like, yeah, go for it. Like, I'm not going to be like, you should be a doctor. <laughs> like, you know, always these financial kind of jobs, but I'm just going to like go with your gut feeling and make whatever makes you happy. Um, so those are the things that I take away from this uh, experience that I'm going through. But um, yeah, I think anything that's um, I guess when we're making, there's, there's always doubts that come into my mind. Like, oh, what is this? <laughs> what is this you're making? But then overall, it's you just going with your gut feeling, like whatever makes you happy. And I think that's something that I kind of relate to what you were saying about if I'm happy, then I'll let it go and it's, I've done my thing with the work and then we'll move on. Yeah. I mean, I constantly feel guilty because I got not get bad grades in high school, so I could have just got done something, you know, like stable and live that life and kind of be able to support my family in the way they need and kind of provide my mum with the stability she desires. So there is a constant guilt in that aspect, especially um, it is really hard making work and being an artist. So I don't even know how you guys handle that. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm struggling every day now um so yeah it is really difficult and yeah there is a lot of guilt but then it's like i think mm, i think everyone has different desires and why they want to be an artist or why they enjoy making work i think one for me is even in my personality test i did it said that i'm a helper 
Um, so, you know, and then as time goes on, I think about what's the best way I can help people. And I think the best way I can do it is through my work, especially because that's how, through art, I was able to understand my position, feel validated in a way, and not just myself, but a lot of people that share similar experiences. So if I think about it like that, I do think it's powerful. And then I do feel like um, experiences like my mother's and many mothers, they should be recognized and validated. So I try and kind of try to carry those ideas and try not to feel so guilty. But I think that's just like part of it. You know, there's always, there's always pros and cons to everything you do. I think no matter what you do, you're going to be like, oh, but I could do this or I could do that, you know. But I think it's really important to help people around you feel confident and feel like encouraged in what they want to do and not necessarily have this constraint or have the need that they have to go down maybe, not like a traditional path, but a path that people believe you should go down. And I think you have to like really help ch challenge people's ideas of what, just like everyday ideas. And I think it's really important. Yeah. No matter what age you are. Yeah. Um, I talk about a lot of guilt, but I think the guilt I was experiencing, I experienced as a mother is, um, yeah, taking time for myself and making and creating work is, you know, I struggled that that was a real selfish thing to do, I've got a million other things to do. And it was really hard to still sort of look after myself. And I think um, now I know that it is really important to let go of that guilt because in order for me to be the best person I can be and to care for my family and to do what I do, I have to be kind to myself and this is how I'm kind to myself. Mm -hmm. yes, it's like being in a place that brings me joy. I have to do that joy on purpose um, and make time, it's important, for my mental health. <laughs> and, you know, and just to be able to be the best mum or best wife or best friend I can be. Um, I can't give for nothing, and so this is the way I you know, fill my cup. Um, so yeah, it's hard to think that you know it's not easy, um, especially when you, you know I grew up in a family where it's not about you <laughs> a lot of the time. It's about giving and serving others. Yeah. So looking inward is, is a very foreign concept sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know. So, but it's important. It's really. Important. Oh, I love that they were saying that. You can't give from nothing, and your art is what gives you your your something. It gives you your your, your joy, your form. Mm -hmm. And so, because you have your art, you're able to give from that. It's part of your being, right? Yeah. 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 I think it's really unfortunate that um, you know that we even have to have that conversation about what's challenging, because in many ways, it's part of it's endemic in the larger world that we live in, right? It's part of the financialization of the capitalist system that you know we all live with every day. Which doesn't value women, doesn't value mothers, doesn't yeah. value artists. Um, and we know, you know, women have come have come a long way, but there's still such a long way to go. And I think that's why these conversations are really important to um, look at how people people's ways of coping and strategizing and thinking what else, you know, we can do. In a way, in the art world, there's a lot of discussions around the living wage for artists, mm. which, you know, you can imagine if there was a living wage for artists, not only would it be economic and help to survive by nature, but it would give that sense of validation mm. that um, you're talking about being really to where you feel like, well, I'm doing something that no one really values, you know, like I can feel like there's a sense of that as a career, mm. like you were saying, you could be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. So there's, you know, lots of other ways maybe that people are really trying to argue for and to give some of that that um, presence in the structure that we have already that we we live with. But I think it's also examples such as yourself that really show how, you know, women artists are so important. They're the most important 
artists in the world at the moment, you know, really predominantly for the work that they're making. And yeah, it's just so great to hear from you, your thoughts, and um, some they, they come with challenges, and work comes with challenge, but um, also I really see it's like part of your helpful being and your um, personal being, and I think that's also what we really cherish about people being able to convey that in a creative way or in whatever what what particular um, way they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a sort of validation um, comment, not really a question, but I just sort of really find that structure that we live in has really been um, a lot of the, the um, predominant, created a lot of issues that I think um, women are still dealing with today. I mean, like you said as well, like, I feel like I've taken on kind of similar ways of thinking and ways of being, like, my mother is, like, very, like, guilty, like, we're basically serving others or it's to make sure everyone else is okay, mm. you know, and I think for me, I definitely have that, especially when I get into, like, relationships, I feel like I kind of, kind of push down parts that are important to me as long as, you know, trying to make the other person happy, mm. which is something that you have to constantly reflect and think about because it's like you're aware of that kind of old way of being and how it's not really sustainable, mm. you know, and it doesn't actually help anyone in the long run, you know. Mm. Like, I feel like my mum, in a way, she probably doesn't think she's independent, but, you know, for my siblings and I, we view her as a very independent and strong woman. She literally moved here without speaking any English and raised three crazy children, <laughs> you know, at a time where internet didn't exist. So, you know, we take on those like ideas and be like, if she can do it, mm. you can do it either. That's right. Yeah. You know, so, like, I mean, I'm sure there's, like, ways that you don't realise that, like, you know, in yourself that you're being, like, a certain, like, way or, like, a really good mo role model for your children, but I'm sure they can, like, pick up on this. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for them to see that, you know, yes, I'm a mother, but I also have other things. That's not solely who I am, you know. Right. There's other things mm -hmm. of me that are equally as important. Or that I care about, you know, and it's good for them to see that to realize that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the the articles I read across when I was looking at this topic was a, an interview with these two women artists, and the question was, "What practical advice would you offer for women artists if they became mothers?" And the first artist said, "Well, give up on having a rigid schedule." Because you're not going to be able to do that. But the second artist says, you know, but this question puts all the weight on the mothers. And the question should really be more of what can the art world do to be more inclusive to mothers? So let's, we don't have to carry it. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like a lot of other oppression when you talk about sexism or racism. You know, racism really isn't a people of color issue, right? Sexism is a, just a, a woman's issue. And it's sort of like what Zara was saying, what can we do as a community, as artists, to make it better for everybody to be able to participate and give their best? Um, so I would ask all of us, the artists here, the panel, and you, the audience, what practical advice or how do you think it'll be it would make it better for for women to be working as artists, and if they decide to have a family, what would be help, what would be helpful? I think allowing mothers um, a different pace in in how how we create and the schedule of exhibitions or how prolific we are. Um, you know, for me. It was right, and I never had guilt when I did it in the right time. And yeah. so, for years, I didn't have to. I wasn't, you know, a practicing artist because I had babies, mm -hmm. and that felt good and right. And 
and then slowly as they got older, um, I can take more and more and more. Um, and and for some of us, for me, you know, I needed that permission to do that, and for for my community to say, you're still an artist, even if you haven't painted a picture in the last year. We we acknowledge and, and honour your decision, mm -hmm. um, you know, and for so just the whole case, like why why do we have to be full of it all the time? Mm -hmm. um, aren't our children pieces of art as well? Mm -hmm. um, aren't they the most precious and beautiful? Um, isn't the picture of our family and what we embody as as a package a piece of art? Isn't that a message? It is. So like acknowledgement for that and um, and a treasuring of that, like you say, like, where is the support for that? Um, yeah, for for an artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you write out forms and things, and um, you say, "What's your occupation?" occupation. <laughs> and I was kind of struck. I kind of pause <laughs> with writing mother, which is so sad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just this concept that being a mother isn't. Isn't like good enough. Yeah, not good enough, or I don't know. It's just, or well, even writing an artist, you still got that kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of, I guess, perception of what that is. Um, I guess look, that's what I'm really passionate about with like my role here at the gallery is making spaces safe for families and for artists. Does everyone know what Teresa does here at the gallery? Tell people yeah, I'm fortunate enough to be very privileged to be the um, Pacific Public Programs coordinator here. Been here a year now. Um, <laughs> but a lot of my work is working with communities. And an example of what I'm talking about was an event we had here, La 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 Speaker, and we had the group EV, were one of the, the groups we invited to take part in this wonderful day. And they were a group of like 12, 10, and they had children and they had whānau uh, that were to come. So, you know, we had to accommodate for these women to be part of this event by including the children and who they needed as their support to take part. And I think that's that's the key for organisations like the gallery or, um, to really think how was it going to be safe for you to be here? And how are you going to enjoy your time with us, yeah. not having to sacrifice, you know. I know there are restrictions around budgets, but just those little things can really make a difference from artists feeling validated mm -hmm. and feeling valued, that their work is important, that they do they still want you to be here in this space. So just little things like that. Mm -hmm. I want to add to that that I just asked everybody. I want to add not only what would you ask of the community and arts organizations, but what would you, if you could like wave a magic wand and if you could ask your family, your parents, your support network, your partner, um, what you needed from them, what you needed from your mom, what you needed from your children, what you needed, what would you say to them? If you could have, you could wave a magic wand and you could have it, what would that be? <laughs> everyone. <laughs> everyone. Give <laughs> them money, time to travel, to get out of my usual, which is a privileged and wonderful bed space, but I want more and I want to go back to Samoa and I want to mm. go to Auckland every six months, you know, yeah. that. So, like, resource to go, yes. which is a big sacrifice for them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What else would we want? If we could have anything from our support network, what would we want? I feel like not from my support network, so who I've asked what. I just ask them. But <laughs> but I just feel like everyone deserves to have like the basic needs, you know, to live in a decent house that's not damn, like in Wellington, you know, just not be a, not have to work so hard for basically food, uh, like going to the doctors, dentists. I just I think like everyone just 
being able to afford basic human stuff without having to just like work their ass off every single day would really change the way the world is. And I mean like, you know, a lot of people are not having children anymore. And the people like the birth rate or whatever is going down drastically in a lot of countries because I think that like, has to do with, you know, a lot of work and the, the way we live right now doesn't really cater to being able to take care of children, being able to support children, you know, because of back in the day, people saw it as like the woman's role, but now people are like, no, I, I can do other things as well. And it's just like the world doesn't cater to that. The world never really validated it in the way. So there's not that much like support in general. That's why people are deciding not to have children because there's no support system that's been set up. I'm not saying that that's the only reason why people want to have children. Everyone has their own reasons, but I think that is also like a big reason that people decide not to do it because they don't feel supported by society. You know, and it's a it's a big thing for a lot of people just themselves and their families to take on. You know. What would you want to say, Tom? Studio. <laughs> <laughs> Studio. Yeah, yeah, but this, yeah, it can be quite, like another bill to add to life. But Is it close to home? Yeah, it's close. It's, um, it's at Mud Studios, which is in Mount Wellington, so it's just like a five minute drive. Um, I guess it's just like to my family, just be like, don't stress. Like, I know life is really hard as it is. But um, yeah, just like um, cherish like the little moments, um, go for a walk, just you know, don't hold on to stuff that might stress people down or whatever. Um, and yeah, just whatever happens, just roll with it, uh, and things will come back to its original path when it happens. So, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. Don't stress too much. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess for me, I'm really um, fortunate to understand that um, my purpose or my life is, you know, there is a plan. I don't know what it is. This is just how I, what I believe. And, but also that my children are all part of that. So it's not, you know, I'm not missing out because I've got children. <laughs> it's woven in beautifully and that's how it's meant to be. I think um, my work or my creative spaces have been the more richer because of living and um, my children and what I've learned as being a woman today and so yeah. I guess like you want to share the things that make you most happy with happy the, with the people that you love the most. So like, you know, with your residency as well, of course you want to take the children there because you're like, this is so cool. <laughs> I want to share with you. Like a, anything I do, I try and like get my mum down, mm. you know, but she's terrified of driving long distance. Yeah. That's why she's not here. Yeah. But you know, of course you want to share the things that you love the most, the things that make you happy with the people you like cherish. Mm. 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 No. That's probably the easiest one. Yeah. 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 Does anyone have any other questions for our panelists or any other comments? Mm -hmm. I would love to know what what's a big dream that's maybe like too big that you that you had that you hope might one day or that you are actually like that, so I'm going. Please don't answer that. This is for everybody. We're all going to have to answer it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I guess one of my, I, I'd, I'd say it's my bucket list. Mm -hmm. I'd love to go to Europe. I'd love to see all the beautiful big art galleries and museums of my daughters. <laughs> That's a big, big thing. Yeah. 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 Ye
just all this, you know, you've learned about all this at art school and art history, and I'd love to see those in, in person. I'd love to travel there you know, with my girls. I guess mine is like that with my mother and my family. But the other one would be for my work to be as visible and accessible as possible. Like, for instance, uh, you know that oh, DJ Peggy Goo? You know, she's Korean and she's, she's Korean and she lives in Germany, I think. But, um, you know, her work merges a lot of her singing in Korean and in English, and it's just so accessible and it's beautiful and people love it so i guess in a way i want my work to be kind of able to engage a lot of people and just get out there because i mean like for me listening to it for a lot of people listening to it they'll be like oh my god that's so cool like i don't necessarily need to be a certain way like i could mix things up in unexpected ways and still do something awesome so yeah, and also have my own ice cream magnet wrapper, <laughs> just like her. <laughs> Stay in hotels, <laughs> friends in Greece. <laughs> yeah. I like it when you feel big. <laughs> this world is crazy. Uh, yeah, same thing, just travel and uh, provide for my family and make sure they're happy. Yeah. What about you, Marianne? What would be a big dream for you? Um, like the speaking to that, um, be the artist. Um, I'd love to sit with people like you guys, like real <laughs> Um And we're all real. Everyone here. Yeah, and just get into some amazing spaces for amazing conversations. With yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of artists um, mm -hmm. in, in the room. I'd love to hear from you as well. So what are some big dreams of yours? <laughs> this is now the summer war. Yeah. Big dreams? Just anything? Uh, to exhibit overseas. Uh, Asia. Um, predominantly there, but mainly Europe. Europe and Barcelona. Mm -hmm. That's my place here. I think this is a good way to um, end our Colorado, um, unless you have any other comments or questions. But I also wanted to um, ask Simon for you to, to say a couple of words because I loved how you suggested this co pop up. And can you talk to us a little bit about? your thinking in coming up with this topic. I knew you were going to ask this. <laughs> um, yeah, so as Elaine mentioned, um, one kind of a key artist in our show, just down the hallway, is Maria Olsen. Um, and um, she has a work in our collection, which I, I did some research around. Um, she unfortunately passed away in 2014, so, um, uh, I don't really want to speak on behalf of her or, or um, kind of claim any insight into her thinking or her relationships. But um, yeah, her role as a mother kind of informed her trajectory. So she, she graduated from Elam in the mid 60s and then takes about 10 years off from making. And there's this wonderful interview she did with um, Lisa Barry in, in, the, in the 80s where she's talking about um, kind of returning to practicing in the late 70s and 80s. And she says, oh, the kids just weren't enough. Um, or she, but yeah, she found herself compelled to, um, yeah, continue doing something she loved. Um, and as much as she loved her children, she, she needed that creative outlet, that kind of space for thinking and, and, um, and making. Um, and the works themselves are quite confronting. <laughs> There's lots of big cauldrons, um, there's lots of strange layering. But in another interview, she, she um, 
uh, she kind of used this layering of, of muslin, soaked in gesso, to make these quite um, uh, confronting, organic, otherworldly shapes. Um, but she talked about um, seeing her daughter break her leg and, and the doctor kind of using that method of plastering the leg and kind of folding that into her practice. So um, even though it's sort of like not obvious, there's that kind of um, that relationship of care kind of mm -hmm. an undertone. Which I enjoyed. Um, and I did manage to speak to her daughter as well, so her daughter was super helpful in, in planning the show. Um, and two of her daughters are, are artists in their own life as well, which was um, nice, nice lineage there. Mm -hmm. Your assignment. So um, I want to give our artists the last word. Any last thoughts about? Art and Rutherford and your practice after our little poll read out this morning with our audience asking questions in their comments. Any last thoughts? Mm -hmm. I don't have any. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anything. Just thankful for the opportunity to share and be amongst an amazing artist, woman that are making huge waves in New Zealand and abroad. That's what she all the best. We were feature exhibitions in Europe and you know, watching and supporting you always. Thank you. Yeah, just thanks and um, thanks for everyone. Um, yeah, I appreciate everyone's time and I guess just make things that make your soul happy. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. And thanks for everyone for joining us this morning. And um, yeah, so that's our program of this morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.